Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Bohr. As chair of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Committee on Enhancing Coordination between Land-Grant Colleges and Universities, I would like to welcome everyone to today's virtual workshop session entitled The Role of Capacity for Collaboration in the Land-Grant System. This is the final workshop session of the committee's study and serves as our capstone event. Earlier this year, the committee posted for stakeholder feedback 17 preliminary observations about collaboration across the land grant system. Nowhere in our original document did the word capacity appear. However, in the responses that we received from stakeholders, the word capacity was mentioned 38 times in different contexts that ranged from the ability of a faculty member to have the skills to lead collaboration to the ability for faculty to carve out time from their teaching and other commitments to participate in collaborative activity to the ability of an institution to take on partnerships to expand its reach. The notion of capacity constraints was also raised in many other contexts, such as in the pros and cons of capacity funding and competitive grants. So the committee felt it was important to explore this topic and its dimensions a bit further. As it happens, very recently, we discovered a report that was released from the Board on Higher Education and Workforce entitled Defense Research Capacity at Historically Black Colleges and Universities and Other Minority Institutions, Transitions from Good Intentions to Measurable Outcomes. As we looked at that report, we recognized very similar themes to those identified by our stakeholders. And to that end, we are delighted to have with us today the co-chair of the committee that produced that report, and that's Dr. Alicia McLean, and she will give us an overview of that report's findings. We are also pleased that we are joined today by Rolanda Flores Galarza from New Mexico State University, which is designated as both an 1862 land-grant institution as well as an Hispanic-serving university. We are also joined by Benita Litson from Diné College, which serves the Navajo tribe. We will hear what capacity means in terms of their institutions and their work, and particularly as it relates to collaborative efforts. Afterwards, we'll have a discussion with the three of these presenters and members of the committee. The public can also ask questions, which I will get to in a moment. We have several members of the study committee joining us online today. And in the interest of time, rather than have them introduce themselves individually, I'm going to ask the study staff to put up a slide with a list of the members so that the public audience can see who is on the committee. This virtual workshop is intended to inform the final report of the committee, which we plan to complete and to release in September. The committee's report will make recommendations on how to encourage collaborations across the land grant system that will be successful and impactful. So we are looking forward to, insight, to insights from today's discussion that will inform those recommendations. Before we begin, I want to let you know that the meeting is being recorded and the recording will be posted on our project website about a week after this meeting. During the question and answer period, I'd like to ask everyone online to be mindful of the fact that the committee has not yet completed its report. So please don't leave here today thinking that comments made by members of the committee are, are formal positions of the committee. And in addition, please recognize that committee members sometimes ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that might not be indicative of their own personal views. I would also like to note that there is a Q&A box that the public can use to ask questions of today's speakers. We will get some of those questions answered as time permits. Please type in your questions at any time during the presentations so that we can have the questions ready for the discussion period. And with that, 
I would like to, to move to the first presentation uh, for this session, and that is Dr. Alicia McLean. Alicia McLean is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Chemistry, and she's director of the Dord Institute for Mathematics and Applied Sciences Scholarship Program at Norfolk State University in Norfolk, Virginia. This institute provides a rigorous honor program for students majoring in science, engineering, and mathematics to help prepare them for success in their graduate or medical school pursuits. Dr. McLean is a member of the American Chemical Society, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the National Organization for the Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. She is also a Diamond Life member of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc. Dr. McLean has a BS in chemistry from Benedict College, a Master of Science in Inorganic uh, Polymer Chemistry from Clark Atlanta University, and a PhD in Agriculture and Environmental Chemistry from the University of California, Davis. And with that, Dr. McLean. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bohr, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Alicia McLean, and I serve as chair, uh, as vice chair, I'm sorry, of the Academy Study. Um, I want to thank you all for joining me today to help allow me to go over an overview of the uh, consensus study report from the Committee um, on Defense Research at Historically Black Colleges and Universities and other minority uh, institutions. Uh, let's see, let's share my slides. Can you guys see that? Sorry about that. Yes, we see it. Okay. Full screen? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, again, this study is on the defense uh, capacity uh, at his HBCUs and other minority service in, uh, institution. So before I begin, uh, I want to take this moment to thank um, uh, Ms. Evelyn Kent and her colleagues of the Secretary of the Defense uh, actually for their uh, and the basic research op office and the Department of Defense as a whole for an, this invested interest and for this study and the committee's request. In terms of um, the charge, um, as some of you may know that this particular study um, originated in the language in the FYI 2020 um, NDA legislation and framework um, as a framework. And so the National Academy's task force was the overarching charge for this particular committee to examine the status of HBCUs uh, research at, um, for the Department of Defense and um, minority institutions and the methods and means to advance this research capacity at these particular uh, institutions. So before we get into the report uh, conclusions and recommendations, it is important that I uh, First note that the NDA language uh, called for this particular study uh, specified a focus on minority institutions. With the NDA defining HBCUs and other institutions of higher education with at least 50% underrepresented minority uh, enrollment. Within this particular report, the committee flagged the points that minority institutions, which are MIs, are defined differently as MSIs. Than the, in, than the MSIs, which are more likely known as minority serving institutions. So M MSIs that we may know is institutions that are either historically defined or enrollment defined and have varying thresholds uh, requirements for minority enrollment and institutional expenditures. So for example, Hispanic serving institutions are designated, which are HSIs can be designated as MSIs but certain, certain HSIs may not reach the student enrollment threshold uh, criteria to be categorized as MIs. Therefore, it's very important that uh, for this particular report in implementing policies, MIs 
are a subset with the larger group of MSIs and the research on MSIs cannot necessarily be applied with focusing on um, MI uh, institutions. So to actually address the core uh, tenets of the study, the committee developed two frameworks um, that it believed would uh, be useful in um, moving for good intentions towards expressing the stakeholders um, uh, to measurable outcomes. And these particular two frameworks were used to actually examine um, the capacity of HBCUs and MIs. Um, the committee determined the conclusions were based on the uh, research um, findings for a range of topics um, to the methods and means and necessary for advancing the for HBCUs and MIs. So in the next several slides, um, the committee research framework conclusion kind of talks about the full scope. There were um, a framework that we would like for you to um, look at in terms of the purpose of the report to determine the institution capacity of that was conducted DOD related research uh, for these three mutually exclusive forces. So as you can see, we have the strong institutional research and uh, contract based um, work. And then you have your research faculty followed by your ancillary services. So I wanted to note that although there are other factors for, that are, can be used as actual indicators uh, to each program announcement or solicitation that could be considered for assessing research capacity, the committee framework kind of focused on these three overarching um, groups that we thought were necessary um, in effectively to compete for DOD funding. This slide shows the framework, um, uh, how the committee developed a framework to fully comprehend the um, and describe the research relevant to um, the different variations of HBCUs and MIs as they are in a spectrum of research activity across the US of higher education um, landscape. So while we know that HBCUs and MI share com uh, commitment to supporting students' uh, success, especially for students of color, they uh, generally greatly vary um, in terms of the size or the affiliation, the location, the resources as such. So in order to provide you with a kind of scope in terms of the conic classification system, the committee uh, wanted uh, you to note that the established framework categorized U.S. colleges and universities in seven different um, groups. And those groups are doctoral, granting institution, master's colleges and universities, baccalaureate colleges, baccalaureate associate colleges, associate colleges, special focus institution, and tribal colleges and universities. But most notably for this particular study, with doctoral granting universities, institutions are designated as R1, which are very high research active, and R2, which are high research active. So this particular slide gives you an idea and the variations in mind that the committee developed a spectrum uh, on the research activity for undergraduate centric, research engaged, uh, research active, where they're more actively involved in securing grants or either highly uh, research active, meaning that they have less um, uh, teaching loads and things of that nature. So this just gives you an actual scale on how um, we broke down the, the actual categories for each one. So we wanted to highlight um, that for this event that the final uh, chapter of this report, the committee represent two overarching uh, conclusions of the report that actually uh, captures the committee's highest priority findings. Um, in the first, um, in terms of strategic commitments, uh, the goal is that we hope that the Department of Defense and um, the undersecretary could increase the research capacity of HBCUs and MIs to a more uh, successfully compete for and execute DOD awards. So long-term and additional investments are needed in research infrastructure, uh, programmatic support, as well as um, personnel. And also you find that there's some insufficient data collection um, that involves um, interdepartmental program coordination, long-term uh, rec recordings, as, as well as a lack of evaluation of to a, appropriate access DOD total investment. So these are some of the measurable impacts on the advancement of the uh, research capacity 
for HBCUs and MIs. Here we uh, present an overview of the 2022 final report recommendations, methods and means, and to increase defense research capacity of HBCUs and MIs. Uh, for the sake of time, we have abbreviated some of uh, the language. So we urge all of you to visit the summary of chapter six of the report to review all of the recommendations uh, in much more greater detail. Um, this first slide talks about how the committee um, analyzed, the, first the committee um, analysis for the funding data was from FYI 2010 through 2020. And it indicates that there's not been much uh, significant like expansion in the funding of um, research projects or research capacity awarded to a vast majority of HBCUs and MIs. So the data shows significant decrease in actual length and type of DOD funding awarded to HBCUs and MIs. And so HBCUs actually re receive a disproportionate amount, smaller share of the DOD and research development related funding that compared to non-HBCUs and MIs. So the committee found that there was a significant difference in the research support um, between the HBCU I HBCUs MIs, as well as the non-HBCUs MIs. And they also um, looked at the HBCU MIs would not be able to compete um, or become competitive as the other institution for DOD fundings without these um, areas that are listed and shown here. So that to actually to address these disparities, DOD existing um, discrete targeted HBCU funding and equipment funds should be redirected or significantly enhanced, or a new program should be initiated to actually focus on uh, long-term uh, capacity for institutional um, work. So this just shows a recommendation A, um, which lists this um, in terms of the physical infrastructure, the institutional uh, support, programmatic support, and the business venture. This next slide shows uh, part C, where the committee states that um, some additional funding requests um, and appropriated for HBCU MIs and capacity building should be deployed to put military departments, um, S&T program offices in more direct contact with HBCUs. So it's hoped that these additional funds with more discretionary authority can allow institutional uh, costs will be generally aimed at long-term capacity building not discrete short-term uh, research capacity. Now, early in the um, discussion, um, the study process data collection phase, we requested data from the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the military departments related DOD levels of investment and measurable impacts on the advancement of HBCUs and MIs. However, the data was insufficient to actually meet our needs, specifically in terms of the organization, the details and the types, um, the completeness of data submission. So it kind of made it difficult for the committee to actually formulate uh, research questions. So the committee offered recommendations to address um, these um, deficiencies in data collection, including related to proposal submission, as well as research capacity. So 3A, 3B, and 3C are shown here, where 3A uh, focuses on data collection and evaluation. Um, we felt that the data collection and analysis should be uh, continual and consistent across all of the military department agencies. In terms of proposal data collection for recommendation 3B, um, um, the, we hope that the um, data collection and coordination of USD and r and &E, um, in collaboration with the Military Department of Defense and the other defense agencies that they should develop guidelines for data um, collection on defense research and institutional capacity of HBCUs um, MIs. In addition, we asked, uh, we made a recommendation that the, relate, the um, USD and RE should be um, issued to ensure coordination data collection and an existing database should be developed in order to provide um, DOD proposal data so that the funding trends across the board for HBCU and MIs can be compared with other um, institutions um, in a systematic and organized manner. 
And then the last recommendation, which is 3C, uh, we're looking at the research capacity collection of evaluation of data, uh, specifically the USD r &E. Engineering should work with the military department of defense agencies and institutions of higher education to do the following as listed in one through four. And as you can see, determine the areas of data collection on the institutional uh, capacity, define the components of the research capacity for institution and higher education, as well as support future data analysis and access of the impact. So the data collection and the analysis um, should be performed um, on a continuous basis for all DOD grants and contract across the IHEs and should result in a formal and annual report to offices of the Secretary of Defense and Congress early in the calendar year to inform the development of future um, National Defense Acts and appropriate um, affiliations. In terms of fostering true partnership, uh, this was one of the themes of the partnership resonated throughout the committee's discussion in terms of defining what a true partnership should be. Uh, one of uh, true partnerships, um, we define that they should be one that are grounded on mutual respect, meaningful engagement, equity, and funding and resources can present good opportunities for joint research and collaboration, workforce development, and technology transition and commercialization. And this is in order to help HBCUs and MI build and advance their own capacity to actually conduct uh, DOD funded uh, research. So the committee agreed upon three recommendations related to fostering two uh, true partnerships. Uh, recommendation um, for A, um, discuss how USD r &E should move past encouraging partnerships to incentivizing mutually um, beneficial true partnerships by adding those elements uh, through an awarding um, evaluation criteria um, status so that the HBCUs and the MIs can actually de um, develop and strategize on um, working on true partnership with these particular agencies. Recommendation for three, um, in terms of having contracts with true partnerships, it should include increased funding uh, support for the partners um, and longer performance periods to allow for the capacity building to um, occur at your HBCUs and MIs. Recommendation 4C, uh, we're trying to encourage the use of independent research and development um, to support HBCU MI research, uh, capacity building, additional funding uh, directed to small business, um, technology transfer research, as incentives for um, actually partnership with HBCU MIs. And then recommendation 4D, um, it is hoped that this particular recommendation in terms of establishing data or descriptive tools as a resource, um, we hope that it can help aid in developing research and educational um, tools for collaboration between DOD funded um, entities as well as HBCUs, uh, UARCs, FFRD um, industries, as, as well as other um, facilities. Um, these the recommendation five and six in terms of true partnerships, uh, we looked at other recommendations in, in regards to USD and R&E should examine and highlight HBCUs um, that are in kind of pro proximity to DOD research centers and other DOD entities we thought that that would kind of help build um, the relationship between the faculty and those centers that are in close, close proximity and help to incentivize um, relationships in that capacity of those that are in the areas. And also we want to look at um, defense, um, the depth score and your F score programs to kind of help um, serve as models to expand um, the research capacities areas with low participation. Uh, such as your um, tribal colleges and university. And then lastly, recommendation six, uh, we was thinking that the USD and RD should compile a list of the HBCUs and MI institutions that receive STEM funding from other federal government agencies. Uh, and this list should be included um, data for their graduate programs, um, the majors that are office, as well as their research capabilities at those uh, particular um, institutions. And lastly, in terms of incorporating a promising practices and programs, 
um, the uh, committee expanded its programs related to the HBCUs and MIs and other federal government agencies. DOD has a number of programs that are actually designed to actually um, retain students uh, specializing in um, areas of STEM. And this includes their SMART programs that um, provide um, scholarships and fellowships um, to students um, in specific areas as it relates to um, DOD. Um, this particular funding has demonstrated a long-term success in the workforce um, development and helped to increase the capabilities of HBCUs and MIs. And it also offers practices for other government agencies um, may be suitable for adoptions and by the DOD. So we was thinking um, that some of the practices that involve with the NIH and NSF in terms of trying to help um, establish these particular type of roles, um, that these are some um, practices that DOD may want to try to implement and try to share with um, Congress as well as the White House Office of Science and Technology Policies and Con and policies in order for them to actually be able to identify the opportunities and thus strengthen collaboration with those agencies to seek in a, um, leverage to seek and leverage opportunities for um, building capacities at HBCUs and MIs. So in conclusion, I'd like to show this uh, slide includes the committee's um, recommendation. These are our committee representatives. And again, I encourage you to visit the project page as well as our final report for any additional um, details on the pro um, program. Thank you for, um, for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. McLean, not only for your service on this important committee, but for summarizing these really critical points for us today and then for participating in the conversation that is yet to come in this session. So now I would like to turn to Dr. Rolando Flores Pilarza. He is the Dean and the Chief Administrative Officer of the College of Agricultural, Consumer and Environmental Sciences, a position that he has held since 2016. In his current role, Dr. Flores demonstrates how technologies, including big data, artificial intelligence and green energy can improve everything from water usage efficiency to soil health and carbon management. Far from being an ivory tower technocrat, Dr. Flores connects directly with the people in rural communities who benefit the most from his research. He engages regularly with farmers and ranchers from rural communities and Native American land across New Mexico, as well as the Mexican states of Chihuahua and Sonora, to help improve food production and in the process, their livelihoods. Born and raised in Costa Rica, Rolando joined his country's National Production Bureau after earning his mechanical engineering degree in 1974. Tasked with overseeing food processing investment projects, Dr. Flores implemented a series of technical innovations that sparked an economic revolution in Costa Rica a revolution that continues to reverberate. Today, the country exports nearly 80 agricultural products in contrast to the four or five when he first joined the Bureau. In the 1980s, Dr. Flores came to the United States, earned a master's degree from Iowa State University, followed by a PhD from Kansas State University. After several years as a US Department of Agriculture researcher and later as an educator and administrator at the University of Nebraska, he joined New Mexico State University. And with that, Dr. Flores, please. Thank you, Dr. Board. That was pretty generous uh, <clears throat> introduction. Uh, thank you very much to all of you that I have the, that wanted to, I wanna, I wanna share some of the, the experiences that we have in New Mexico. Uh, and by, by means of this, I'm going to be a little bit into the parochial side by looking at the, at the college, basically. And, and I wanted to, to share some, some, uh, some data uh, with the college, uh, of the college here. So let's see how we can get this done. Uh, okay. So the... The, the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences 
encompasses uh, 12 uh, departments, uh, academic department, but it is, is the major dri driving, driving force for the mission of the land grant university. And this is a teaching, research, and extension. As the land grant university closes to a border, and specifically to the busiest animal crossing uh, border in the world is here in, in Mexico. Uh, and we are four minutes from the border. It really creates a, a lot of very interesting uh, conditions. However, the, the college and uh, college of ACES as defined by, by the, uh, the main uh, letters uh, is around four major pillars and in which we guide our strategic plan and our activities, food and fiber uh, production and marketing, water use and conservation, family development, health of New Mexicans, and environmental stewardship. Okay, this is a summary of, and I don't, I'm not gonna go into too much more details of what the college is. And because what I wanna do is, is, is take advantage of this opportunity, as it was mentioned about what, what capacity is. Uh, we go, um, we have about 40 degrees, uh, we have, thick, um, 1,500 undergraduate students. Uh, we have about 200, uh, close to 250 graduate students. Our, we have 33 offices in the state, uh, one in each county by the cooperative extension. We have 12 science centers in very distinctive geo, uh, geological and, and, and climatological areas of, of New Mexico that allow us for doing extensive, extensive work. Uh, within the the college, we have eight academic departments. We have nine departments in extension that are, all of those that are in, uh, under the same subject matter are under one leadership. So independently of the, so basically only four are independent in, in departments of, of extension. The college has the, do you see the, the budgets of uh, 27 million of the cooperative extension and, and then we have in 34 million in agricultural experiment station. During the last six years, the college has had the, the privilege of being the number one college of submitting funding, uh, proposals for funding, and the largest amount uh, that has in uh, uh, grants awarded. Uh, we, uh, last year, we submitted around 248 uh, Proposals we receive in the order of, uh, we submitted about $80 million for requesting for funding, and we get close to, to $30 million. Uh, this is, is quite impressive for, for, for the college, at least for us. Uh, the demographics of the college of New Mexico, and specifically of the college, I have them here on the screen, uh, which is very, very interesting. We have is the, the Females uh, is predominantly in the college. It's about 62% on the average, but college departments like animal and brain sciences is 67% uh, compared to the other ones. In terms of Native American presence, we have an, uh, in the college 3.3 uh, versus the 1.9% uh, in the in at the at the university. May uh, notice that. We are located in Las Cruces, which is way south of, of New Mexico. And most of all the 18 tribes, uh, Pueblos and the three Apache tribes are more uh, in the northern part, but we have quite a strong presence uh, with, the, with the Native American tribes. We have a program in the college that is called and is independently funded by the legislature that is called India Resource Program and, and so on. So this is a give you an idea of what is the work that the, 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 the activities or the size of the college for some of you. Now, having said that, when we look at the, at the, and it's okay. And these are the, the eight academic departments. And I wanted to stop here because I want you to see how, for example, in, in the college, we call it the College of Agricultural, Consumer and Environmental Sciences. So we go all the way in the food chain from the soil all the way to the, to the gut. We are being very uh, 
less in the last couple of, of years by the uh, fortunate by the uh, voters of New Mexico that approve a couple of geo bonds, uh, general obligation bonds that allow us to have uh, three major buildings uh, for the College of Agriculture. One of those is uh, the food safety and security pilot plant that it will be a meat processing facility along with food processing and so on. A feed meal that, and, uh, and then another one is the bio biomedical facility. These three components are going to be changing the physiognomy of the College of Agriculture, Consumer and Environmental Sciences. Okay, I wanna mention, stop at this point and mention that the, uh, when we talk about capacity, I really was trying to figure out exactly what, what you, you were meaning on that with the cap term capacity, but I just wanted to mention that in terms of capacity funds that the college received from federal funds, uh, it has been, the amount has been very steady over the last 10 years. So that means that over the last 10 years, 7% of the funds for AES, agricultural experiment stations, and 10% for extension have come from federal funds. And now the last five years is 6% of AES and 10% for CES. So this basically, it, it tells you it, the, the funding, the capacity funding by coming directly from the federal funds are being pretty much very, very steady. A couple of comments that I wanna mention here because as, after listening to the previous presentation, and, and the opportunities. I wanna be a little bit more anecdotal in some of, of, of the cases that we, we see here. If you look at uh, the uh, structure of uh, the colleges of the College of Agriculture and, and also happens in the other colleges, we are one person deep across the board. Now, by being the only, the flagship uh, uh, land grant or the land grant university in New Mexico, we are needed to address all the different uh, components that we mentioned, I mentioned before here under the, the, four, the pillars of the college. And, and then pretty much is, is, is a lot that we need to cover. And we are one person deep. The major disadvantage with one person deep is that when you have to submit for proposals, uh, is the, the pool is limited, however, what we have found that it is extremely important and it gives us uh, uh, some leverage in the way how we have been working lately is that by being one person deep, and we cannot too deep in certain areas, it gives us the capacity to build interdisciplinary teams. One example of these interdisciplinary teams, and I'm going to refer to two, one, one is the, the uh, artificial intelligence team. Uh, about three years ago, we started looking at how the different departments uh, were working in engineering and art and sciences, and the need to move the college into digital agriculture. And how do we go beyond to just, uh, instead of following, identifying clearly what are those big demands that New Mexico give us uh, that are quite different than the demands that you find in, uh, in, in, all, in, in the Midwest, for example. So we are in an arid and semi-arid environment in which the, the environments are quite sensible and they, they, they have a, a lot of limitations and we have had other issues to be. So as we look at our agriculture, and this is uh, important to look at that by having done all my work and studies in, in the Midwest is quite different. For example, here in New Mexico, we don't have feedlots and we do actually have a research center in Clay Center, one of those science centers that is dedicated to the uh, imp study of the impact of cattle movement, transportation, and so on and so forth. So it creates a lot of different challenges for us. How do we get deep into resolving some of these problems. Uh, also, uh, the state of New Mexico is very generous with, with the uh, higher education. Uh, in terms of the, we are close to 45, 47% of the funding uh, that the university receives from the state. 
But look at from the point of view that is all of this is 90% is faculty salaries. And this has created a big issues in terms of our science centers, uh, the fair maintenance, which is the general norm all around the, the nation. So when we look at it being just one person deep, and that creates the opportunity to build up teams. I was mentioning about that three years ago, we built up a team with the College of Art and Sciences, the uh, College of Engineering and the College of Agriculture and some elements of the business, College of Business, into putting a team. And of course, we were able to have a couple of faculty members that they were champion this. Well, uh, by at that time, we, we had elements of artificial intelligence, but not a strong team or core activity into that. At this moment, we just got a, a grant of 3 million and we are going to be moving into that direction. It has been challenging and with a lot of persistence to do that. The other component that we have that we have seen in this, when we look at this approach of creating capacity in our limitations is in the area of, of carbon management. Carbon management in the air arid and semi-arid lands is extremely different than if it is managed in, in other areas. So we are able to, to build some of, these, uh, some of these partnerships and some of this uh, work. Uh, most of there, there is cultural issues that need to be broken in, in many cases when there is some traditions of, of just only keeping turfs identified, breaking silos and so on. But I think we are making inroads into, into that direction. And, uh, and those new initiatives in which we are working very strongly is in the incorporation of energy management uh, within farms and our ranches. We actually have one of our ranches in, in Corona that have 38 uh, wind turbines and this wind energy is exported to the city of Los Angeles. So, and this facility is 28,000 acres. So there is area is something that we have a lot here uh, in terms of, of holdings, of land holdings, NMSU. If it is not the largest, it's one of the largest uh, in terms of, of, of land management. I want to, <clears throat> I want to stop here uh, and, and I hope I have addressed some of the major, major uh, elements that were, were expected here. And I will continue here for the further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Flores, uh, that, that you are spot on with regard to the interests of the work of this committee. So we very much appreciate your participation today and look forward to the discussion that will follow. Now I'd like to turn to Benita Litson. And Benita Litson has served in the capacity of the Diné College Land Grant Director since 2006. She is of the Navajo tribe, and has been using her experience in farming and ranching alongside her family as a means to develop much needed programs for Navajo farmers and ranchers on the Navajo Nation. She has spent many years strengthening the Diné College land grant programs and initiatives. Collaborating with 1862 institutions and other higher educational institutions has been a real strength leading to many long lasting programs that were created for students, for farmers and for ranchers. An overarching goal to the programs created is to develop much needed infrastructure to move farmers and ranchers to the next level, whether it is increasing provision of local foods, improving range health or bridging the gap of future farmers and ranchers. And with that, I would like to turn the floor over to Benita Litson. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a uh, panelist today. I hope you all can hear me well. Um, first, I'll do an introduction in Navajo. Um, and I work here at Diné College. I have been here for the past actually 18 years, um, actually really trying to understand land grant um, opportunities and programs at a tribal college 
Um, Diné College is the oldest tribal college across the nation. It was formed in 1968. And since then, you know, there's have been several tribal colleges that have established along the way. Um, we are over 30 tribal colleges across the nation. And in 1994, we were pri privileged to become a part of the land grant uh, family as a 1994 land grant institution. So in the Southwest, we actually do have um, quite a bit of 1994 tribal college land grant institutions. So there's us here at Diné College. We have um, three in New Mexico, which is the Crown Point Institute of Technology or now known as Napo Technical University. We also have SIPI, um, Southwest Indian Polytechnic Institute. And we have um, uh, the, um, there's another one, I just drew a blank on them, but they're based out of Santa Fe um, IAIA Institute for American Indian Arts. And we have another uh, Tahana Autumn Community College down south near the Mexico border in Arizona. So we have four, and I believe um, one other tribal college that's starting up is San, um, San Carlos Community College. And, it, in my understanding, they will be seeking land grant status in, in the years to come as they strengthen their their oper their capacity. Also, so alongside that, you know, we we heard Mr. Flores talk about uh, New Mexico State University um, as you know as a large program, and I was just um, in awe and understanding that just in the agriculture department, he has twelve. That I see 12,000 or 1,000, you know, there was quite a bit of uh, enrollment. And um, us at our college, we have anywhere from 1,300 to 1,500 enrollment, and we have been, you know, fluctuating back and forth. Um, and so in that regards, you know, we think about how small our institution is and, and the different types of degree programs that we do offer here at Dene. So as we began, we, you know, we started more as a certificate granting institution, moved into an associate program. And the past few, I want to say six years, we have moved into offering bachelor's degree programs um, here at Denny College. And just this year, we're going to be offering our first master's degree um, program in biology. So that's a huge stepping stone for us. But if you're not familiar with um, <laughs> tribal colleges and, and how things operate, many of our colleges are um, tribal chartered. Uh, so we do have to also operate under the, the tribal government's uh, structure in addition to um, the chartering institution that charters us to, to be able to um, you know, educate students. Um, so there's multi levels. I feel like there's multi levels of um, things that we need to, to, to think about in terms of capacity building. Um, I can use myself an ex as an example, you know, as I came into the college um, and not knowing what land grant um, meant or means uh, and really trying to figure out what that means for the institution and having the institution also understand that we are a land grant institution and being able to um, support the initiatives under the, you know, the land grant opportunities. Um, I had to really reach out to our 1862 institution. I was privileged to work with New Mexico State University so much closer um, than our own here in Arizona, which is University of Arizona. Um, and it was, you know, just the right time in where I was able to meet with um, Dr. Paul Gutierrez, who was the extension director at the time. Um, and I felt like that mentoring role um, at that time was was much needed, you know, to really understand what an 1862 institution um, land grant capacity is and what we had to build here at a tribal college. Um, and when you think about tribal colleges, um, Diné College is one of the largest tribal colleges on the, you know, across the nation. You have smaller tribal colleges that might have 300 students. Um, and so our capacity, need for capacity building is, is, is much needed um, at multi-levels, I want to say whether it's going to be faculty building research partnerships or research opportunities for our students, 
um, or to staffing to be able to understand what it means to um, run a program or a department um, that's effective and efficient and also just seeking additional funding to support those opportunities that you may want to create. Um, and so another, another, and another piece to this is because we're so close to our tribal um, charter, we also have a lot of turnover in our, in our um, tribal colleges. So as things shift and new people come in, it's a continuous, um, you know, capacity building opportunity for that next person to either understand your program, learn about your program, improve upon what's established um, and being able to, to kind of run with what's already going and, and be a part of the growth to an institution. So that, that's very, very important. Um, on many levels, you know, as we have strengthened the land grant opportunities here at Denny College, um, we're finding that our staffing, you know, needs continuous um, capacity building because um, there's, a, you know, when we talk about extension, there's so many uh, different subsets of, of, of need across the nation, um, just with the pandemic and identifying, you know, our communities struggling with uh, access to food or access to clean water. Um, was definitely an, a huge, huge eye opener. You know, you, you thought about these things and we, we kind of felt like we already were in it, but when you have to drive two hours away for your food, you know, to purchase your food and you see that there's no food on the shelves, um, you, you drove there a long ways and you're coming home without, you know, the amount of groceries that you need for the, the time that you're gonna be at home. So those were huge, huge eye openers for not just us as a institution, but our, our nation. So um, we have started really pushing food security, food sovereignty as, as one of our initiatives in addition to agriculture. You can't, you can't have food without understanding agricultural concepts. So um, in that capacity, it feels like things are moving pretty fast for us and trying to you know, train as many people to be uh, food safety certified and, and being able to grow healthy foods. And, and on the other hand, also training professionals to accept the food that's being grown and putting it into, you know, our food system. Um, and so there's a lots of level of um, multi, I want to say multi-level capacity building that needs to happen. And what has helped us to, to continue to move forward is really um, listening to our stakeholders, listening to our producers. Um, an example, yesterday we were able to meet with over 50, 50 farmers and producers along with uh, local chapter delegations and, and they talked about their challenges as we move out of the pandemic. And so that's a whole new set of um, needs that we need to start developing and, and creating. And what is that training program going to look like? Um, also, the need to ensure that we're training in our own language. Um, it adds an additional, I want to say, barrier because as our new professionals are coming in, they're not fluent Navajo speakers. Um, so we're having to, you know, look for fluent Navajo speakers who also have the educational background to be able to explain the concepts that are being uh, taught. So there's a lot of that, that, and that's where I mean, there's so much, um, so much need. And, and as we listen to our stakeholders, we start to begin to think about what's important to, to them and what do we need to create and what do we need to do to, you know, for ourselves to prepare ourselves to be able to be efficient and effective as we become the instructors, um, whether it's to through an informal education system, meaning going out to the chapters, going out to the corrals or the farm farmlands and being able to do that kind of work. Myself here, we have a staff of six and we're fortunate to have um, several FERTEP agents is what they're called, federally tribal recognized um, extension programs through University of Arizona. I believe they have four. So across the way, we only have 10 extension agents over the Navajo Nation, which is the size of West Virginia. And so one of our ways of, of trying to work effectively is having us meet together and 
pull our strengths together and be able to regionally um, conduct programming together or making sure that we're not duplicating programs in, in certain areas. Um, and so that's been something that we have, have been, I wanna say good at doing and also something that we have struggled with doing. Um, as I mentioned, you know, with turnover, it's it's hard to kind of build, continue to build that momentum as we have to, you know, continuously train another person to 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 act and and respond the same way as we have. So um, for tribal colleges, it's been very very challenging. Um, here at the institution, you know, we're we're really moving toward a research um, based setting. So we're tying. Um, research to the land grant or the community needs. An example is, um, you know, our scarcity in water. What are our alternative water sources and building research around that capacity um, and, and teaching uh, local leaders to have a, a voice at the table, you know, at our, our nation, Navajo Nation table um, to be able to advocate for certain fundings for different regions of the Navajo Nation. Um, and so it's as much as we feel like, you know, we're at the bottom of the, <laughs> of the table when it comes to those decision making, um, the things that we're able to teach is the foundation that brings, um, you know, that those programmings or opportunities to a greater part of the Navajo Nation. So we feel like we're a huge part of um, nation building in an example. And as in the introduction, I was saying infrastructure is very, very important. And that's something the Navajo Nation lacks. As we start training our producers to grow, you know, foods locally and start training them to abide by FISMA, foods, you know, food safety standards, we don't have proper facilities for them to utilize or access so that they can continue to, to make those sales or those connections. Um, so with that, you know, some a lot of my time has been really looking for funding to support long-term infrastructure that's going to support the Navajo Nation and the college at the same time to be able to, to bridge those gaps together. Um, we're happy to say that in our Northern Navajo, which is also in New Mexico, we'll be having a, a, a horticulture center that will now be able to, you know, house a hundred, for farmers and ranchers for conferences and programs. It'll have a commercial kitchen, you know, things like that is, is, is very, very important. But along those concepts, as we build infrastructure, the need to build capacity to fill those positions and understand, you know, the, the ability and the importance of, and the value of these um, part, these programs to, to make those connections happen and to continue to support our farmers and ranchers throughout the Navajo Nation and connecting them to the next generation. Um, yesterday, we, we talked about water security and I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, the, the, the dam in Page, Arizona, but it is one of the main um, electrical forming there's two big dams that does a lot of electrical support to a lot of the Southwest, but they're going dry. And so what, you know, what's going to happen next? So there's so much things going on here and, and we're having to have to reach out and find local, local and regional experts to come in and train our staff, work with our staff so that we're able to get back out to the communities and, and re-educate, um, our communities on these various capacity that's needed across the nation. So um, that's what, what we do um, at a tribal college. I feel like we have a close knit relationship with our, our producers, um, our ranchers. Um, and that's important, you know, having to make sure that we have um, that trust established and, and that, that creates a, I think it, it also creates and strengthens our program. Um, one thing I want to uh, make sure I end with is, you know, this wouldn't be possible with um, continuous collaboration with great partners like New Mexico State University, University of Arizona, um, Utah State University, Colorado State University, because they have those labs, they have those infrastructure already in place. So 
you know, we're, we're constantly finding their state specialists to come out and guide us in different areas um, or, you know, partnering for funding to be able to access um, different pots of money that tribal colleges are not able to. Um, so in that, in that way, um, capacity building is very, very important to tribal colleges, tribal nations, in addition to um, just strengthening, you know, who we are as a tribal college. Um, I think I <laughs> said a lot right here, so I'll stop right there. Thank you so much, Benita, for that very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, greatly appreciated. And so now I'd like to turn to an opportunity. I, I'd like to remind people of the Q&A box where they can uh, add questions uh, for our group. But I'd like to ask a series of questions to our panelists, and I'd like to hear from, from each of our panelists uh, as, as I go through these questions. And the first one that I'd like to start with is uh, thanks to our stakeholders, uh, as we've gone through, the committee has gone through this process. Uh, it's been pointed out to us that capacity can be defined in many different ways and many different dimensions. And so I'd, what, my first question for each of you is, is if, is if you could magically uh, have complete capacity in one particular area, whether that would be personnel, whether that would be infrastructure, whether that would be something, what do you perceive as, as the, the greatest area of need for capacity in your institution? And I'll start with ben Benita and then Alicia and then Rolando. So Benita, if you would start, please. Sure, and I think it's gonna be personnel. You know, um, you know it, it's, you have to have a person that's passionate about their work and being able to, to learn and educate. Um, and if you're not passionate about your work and you just, you know, show up there and kind of do the minimal, you know, you're not gonna be able to have um, a successful program. So I think the building capacity with our personnel, that, that's our foundation. And then infrastructure starts because that's when planning happens. You know, if you're passionate about it, you're gonna, move move things forward <laughs> and that's when it happens thank you alicia okay i would say um at my particular institution it would probably be in the um, research infrastructure in terms of the physical research facilities and equipment um we have faculty who are here working um, in research lab and we have a center you know here on campus but in order to move forward in um, getting the collaboration and um, research capacity, um, we're gonna need to um, beef up the infrastructure because you're bringing in good faculty members, but you don't have any place to place them. Mm -hmm. And so the, that infrastructure um, in terms of the research facilities and the equipment um, that's needed, you know, followed by in the opposite order of the NIDA is the personnel, you know, making sure that, you know, you're able to, um, provide them with the resources that it needs to move the research forward and be able to collaborate with others in departments and, and across the, the US. Thank you, Rolando. Yeah, I think it is, it is obvious that we need to have the capacity for, for having good startups, attract good, good, good faculty. We became, we have become a training place. Mm -hmm. uh, the best faculty get the tenure and it's then after that, it's very hard to compete with larger universities. So we do need, as uh, Alicia say, we need good labs, we need new facilities, and, uh, and I think that is important. But also, in order to build up all these things, I think that the, the one of the, you cannot always ask for money from the federal government or state, you can ask, but you're not going to get all the money that you need. So we need to look at a, an adjustment I would say an alignment of the operational systems with what is what we want to do and how do we want to move. In many cases, it will imply a cultural change. Mm -hmm. So it, it, is, it, is, it is not just only something that you, you solve with money, uh, you need renovated views. And, and I want to take the opportunity to thank Benita for, for all the work that we do together. We actually have a science center in Farmington, which is in Navajo land. So I, I think those are examples of how we can connect more. Is it, is it, is it easy to build up liaisons, uh, teamwork? No, it's the hardest of all. 
and especially internally. Now, when you go externally, you need to break through those bureaucracies. And that's what I was saying, the operational system, systems alignment is needed to get this done. That is the perfect segue to my next question. So, so, so Rolando and, and, and actually uh, Alicia's report as well, identifies the fact that, that uh, effective collaborations take more effort, they, they take a capacity in a different way, whether it's more time, more time spent on building relationships, uh, uh, more resources, uh, very often time being a really critical one and true commitment. And so my next question uh, <laughs> to each of you, and I'm gonna start and go around the other way. So starting, you're still in the middle, Alicia, but I'm gonna start with Rolanda, Alicia, and then up to Benita. And I'm gonna ask how important is collaboration to you and how high a priority do you, do you put on collaboration? And I'm gonna ask you to speak on behalf of your institution uh, in that question. So Rolando, I'll, I'll start with you on that one. Number one, I think uh, with the, how hard it is to get funding mm -hmm. uh, and we cannot allow the work on silos. It is something that, and is the hardest to break. So collaboration interdepartmental within the college, within the colleges. And uh, we have had some success with a Center of Excellence in Sustainable Food and Agricultural Systems that got funded by the governor a couple of years ago. And we are working on that. But that is, for me, that is the most important thing. And that's how I can say we have successes. One of our programs, the Indian Resource Program, has had a lot of success with Danita's team uh, in, in, uh, in bringing sec high, high school students to visit universities and look at that. Thank you. Alicia. Yeah, I think uh, collaboration is very key <clears throat> um, based on the fact that we do all have limited resources. And as a result of the limited resources, we have to find out all of the best practices that everyone um, has been doing well in and bring those pieces together to benefit at your particular institution and share those things across the board so that we all benefit together because the number one goal is to increase the number of you know underrepresented um, scientists in the field and you know have a more diverse um, um, community you know when it comes in the area so I encourage that collaboration as he um, as Rolando stated to build like a culture um, helps with um, building an infrastructure where the government agencies can have do better alignment of how resources are actually uh, generated uh, to tribal colleges and HBCUs so that we can have build these types of relationships among one another. And only thing that could do is actually grow. So we do have centers here um, in material science and research here and the biotechnology center here at um, Norfolk State University. But through collaboration across a, a vast degree area is what makes it success because the resources and the infrastructure isn't here. So everybody has to work together. So I think collaboration is very, very important uh, when it comes to advancing science. Thank you. Benita. I, I agree with both. Um, collaboration is definitely important for um, tribal colleges, especially in the terms of infrastructure and research, because uh, most of our tribal colleges are small. We don't have the same equipment as a larger university. So an example, you know, sequencing, we have to outsource our sequencing uh, for DNA to another institution um, and being able to partner so that our students are able to go there and, and assist in learning how to do so. Um, and, and also there's, I don't want to say barriers, but there's also um, there's a negative side to collaboration too. Sometimes that's taking um, tribal colleges for granted. Also, sometimes you have folks reaching out to you saying they want to collaborate and they've already written a proposal and in the proposal has you visiting their institution one or two times. And that's not very uh, you know, conducive for us. We'd like to be at the table equally and, and be able to have some uh, you know, impact to our students um, too. So you have to be, be careful both ways. Um, so building trust is, is gonna be very, very important for us. Um, 
as we move forward in selecting what types of funding we want to uh, apply for, what types of partnering, how far we have to travel, you know, to get down to New Mexico State University is about six hours. Um, uh, same with all the other 1862 institutions for us, but um, being able to partner in, in selective uh, collaboration, I think is very, very important. So, so Benita, you just beautifully opened the door for my next question, uh, which is uh, from the perspective of, of your institution, what, what do you perceive to be the greatest barrier to collaborations at this time? And so uh, again, Benita, uh, Alicia, and then Rolanda. Wow, <laughs> right now, um, I, I wanna say the administrative side of things, you know, is, I feel like we can easily collaborate and, and work together, but here at, at our institution, the challenges are, um, how do we do cost share matches? How do we do sub award payments? How do we, um, what does a sub award sheet look like? Um, and if we have turnover in our business office, it's, you know, we feel like it shouldn't be our PIs, <laughs> you know, they're those different types of roles. Um, and so here at the institution, we don't have a institutional grants office where we have uh, a person kind of doing budgets for us or submitting the grants on, on our behalf. We as PIs have to do all of that. Um, and so it's, it's an added duty on top of everything else that we're, we're doing. Um, and so that, I think that's our barrier is sometimes we don't get our sub award pay, you know, pay, paid out in time. Yeah. <laughs> we're constantly having to make sure that we're on top of that and, and, and keeping our partners, um, like I said, trust is important. So um, making sure that we're, we're doing our due diligence. Thank you. That's very helpful. Alicia. Yeah, I think um, I agree with Benita in terms of the um, most difficult thing here on campus is the um, administrative support as well as the sponsor programs office. Uh, we, I think we have, a, it's, we have a small group, but when you have the number of faculty that we have that are trying to get these grants written up and trying to get it out, um, it can become pretty difficult for that three individuals to take care of a massive group of you know, faculty who try to bring in the support to help advance the university in STEM and, you know, and do well and be successful at it. Um, the uh, university uh, supports you know, research and efforts, but it can become very difficult to actually um, advance that if you don't have, you know, the proper resources for that. So I would say, you know, the administrative support as well as the sponsor program. And I think that they are there, they want it to happen, but without the lack of resources and building the infrastructure for it, it takes longer for all of that to come together. So it's like, we got to figure out a way how to get a better alignment from the government agencies to help us build the capacity, you know, give us that extra length of time to build the capacity at the university so that we can do those things, building those offices up to provide those resources for us. Terrific. Thank you. And Rolando. Yeah, well, I think uh, Benita and Alicia made it easy for me. I, I totally agree with them. At the university, I can say that the upper administration, there is a clear conscience that the importance of collaborative work internally and externally. And we realize that that is something of the need. But the issue of internal administrative procedures, it is a nightmare. <laughs> and I don't know if this is because all universities have this structural system that they forget who are they working for. But the, the fact is that when we are moving from a university that was running on, on silos to something that is more interdisciplinary, and that the speed in which things needs to be managed, if we are going to do an agreement with, with other university, with other college, even within New Mexico, is the responsiveness is way, way slow. So I and I and I think this is for me, I think is the most critical issue that is facing New Mexico at this time is, is how do we bring up the administrative processes to be more responsive? And respond and answering the times. Uh, it, it is amazing what you find sometimes. And I probably my colleagues are in the same boat. 
Thank you very much. That That's all very helpful. So I think I, I might be able to guess uh, your responses to the next one. And this time I'm, I'm going to start with Alicia and then uh, Rolando and, and then Benita. And, and that is if, if you could pick one entity, whether that's your institutional leaders, whether that's your faculty, whether it's funding agencies, whether it's Congress, or you can pick an entity. And, and you had the opportunity to make one high level recommendation uh, that would be implemented. And that could include funding. So, so uh, but you know, uh, if you could pick one entity and, and one recommendation uh, that, that could go in place to help with supporting collaborations, what would be your top choice? And I'll start with you, Alicia. Okay, I think um, I would go with the institutional, hmm. I'm going back for the funding agencies. I'll go with the funding agencies. I would think that um, one of the things that the funding agencies uh, should do is try to come up with a way of better aligning the true partnerships that they have with tribal colleges and HBCUs um, and MIs in order to have a more balanced um, equity in terms of the research funding. Um, I think that the partnerships are I, I don't want to call it lukewarm, but it's not uh, fruitful in faculty development in order for us to advance our research areas, um, as well as helping us to have partnership with students coming across the board from both sides. So I think if there was a better incentive besides providing internships and graduate students opportunities, students to attend graduate schools at their in, uh, in their programs, that what would that partnership look like and how it would advance at the HBCUs in terms of the infrastructure or the personnel um, in sponsor programs or just providing the support that is needed. So right now, I think it's a little bit one-sided because we're on a contractual, we don't get the big dollars, um, but we're being, we're partnering, but it's not a true partnership. So I would say with the funding agencies, coming up with a better method of, the, of aligning that partnership so that the HBCUs will advance in addition to continuing with the other institutions who we're partnering with. And then it's be a, a beneficial role for both sides. Thank you. Rolando. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm following on, the, on that line of thought. I think it would be great if, if the funding organizations to start organizing ahead of the, the RPF, the, the RPF uh workshops to partner for example what does the the the, the different colleges uh hispanic or minority serving institutions have to offer because we don't have everything and then the other thing is we don't get the chance to compete for those huge amounts of money those things that eventually are going to is a is a is a uh, cash 22 because it will be creating more more capacity more capacity in the ones that already have the capacity but also i think my colleagues already mentioned that many times you get asked to participate in a proposal and everything is already everything is already done we just really need you to sign here we made it easy for you well we don't want the thing easy because we do have a, a tremendous responsibility with our stakeholders I'm tasked with, with creating an environment in which we are an economic engine for a community and economic development of New Mexico. I cannot just jump in anything all over there. I need to put my efforts in something that's going to have an impact in New Mexico. So I would suggest if something is that ahead of time of the proposals, the, the, the funding organizations say, okay, we're inviting to a, a workshop here Come here and see, let's make a poster session. What do you have to offer as a college, as a, as a, as a university and build up partnerships because they have to be two ways partners. Super idea, I love that. Benita. I, I agree with both. Um, I think with us at tribal colleges, um, many of our faculty are stretched way too thin, meaning mm -hmm they are already overloaded. And one of our challenges here at Diné is actually, um, it's hard for our faculty to receive grants because they are overloaded. Yeah. So then it's, um, 
you know, let's find another person, either Benita or another person in that capacity to, um, you know, search for a grant on behalf of the institution because they have a little bit more time and they're not allotted to faculty overload. Um, and so that becomes challenging for us in trying to make sure that research engages our faculty and our students because they're already overstretched too thin and we have to be careful as we go into those collaborations and make sure that our deans are on board um, allowing the faculty to participate. Thank you, that's very helpful. I see from Diane Bailey uh, an interesting suggestion uh, that I'll read and then uh, see if, if there's a reaction from any of you. And, uh, and Diane suggests or asks, would it be helpful for the federal government to set up a centralized function uh, for colleges that, that help support uh, some of the business aspects of, of uh, running these grants? Or would it be helpful for partnering universities to provide that sort of administrative support when seeking collaborations? I guess the question is really, could you see opportunities, whether through a centralized governmental agency or through uh, partnering agency or uh, partnering universities. Let me jump into that. I do really see that. I think we do need help. Uh, we are trying to, to look at how we fix these things, but in the meantime, we cannot wait and say, oh, we will apply next year because we still have to fix things internally. We can do that. So anything that can come from support and the federal government, if it sees, uh, honestly, that they want to, to support the, 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 these institutions and, and bring them up to a higher level of delivery, uh, that is one weakness that we need. I think those two, the one that developing uh, links and develop uh, partnerships and to provide assistance in how, okay, how do we help or what we can do that? I cannot even tell you what are the things that we need to fix internally because they are a nightmare. Okay, Oops. thank you, Rolando. <laughs> Any other comments from Benita or Alicia on this point? Not a comment, but um, I don't know, just going through a lot of the challenges as a tribal college, um, as we try to, you know, work with our business offices or at our administration, I think some sort of, um, you know, like what are the alternative financial softwares that are available so that we're able to, to document, uh, you know, how expenditures are made. Um, an example, you know, I saw the program leader on there. We were late with submitting SF-425s. And, you know, as PIs, you think it's not your responsibility. You think it's the finance, you know, grants and accounting that does that. But it, it's both of your responsibilities and somewhere you put real, you rely on another, but I think there's softwares out there that would be able to help both the PI and, and the grant grantor, but what is available and what is like the next best thing that we could use so that our institutions to know about them um, and, and have access to. I think those, those type of things are important because I think we're still using some old system that uh, <laughs> we were on <laughs> since I came on. So um, you know, we need to really upgrade. Great. Rolanda, did you want to respond to that? That's such an important point, is help, letting technology actually help us. Oh, absolutely. It, it is amazing the impact of spreadsheets because most of this stuff is managed with spreadsheets instead of actually looking at a software that I can allow and have the information closer to our, our hands. Uh, when I have to wait for three weeks for a report that requires immediate action, for example, legislature asks me, why do you still have that science center open? What is the impact of that science center? By the time I start getting all, all the information put together, the, the, it is gone. And, and so I think is uh, the administrative procedures didn't move as fast as all universities had the capability to do that. And I think the mentality in many cases, and this is part of the culture is, oh, we have the, the state cuts funding. So then what do you do? Cut, cut, cut in administrative and cutting programs and so on. 
but he does not look at, okay, we can cut here, but how do we move this and make it more, more ready for the future? And I think that's the challenge right now. I very well said, um, all, all of these points, very well said. So, so we're coming to the end of, of the, the set of questions that I had. I'd like to make sure that those who are uh, participating in this, this session have a moment to ask any uh, lingering questions that they might have. But, but while they're thinking about that, um, I would like to thank sincerely Benita, Alicia, and Rolando for spending time with us this afternoon uh, to discuss these really important questions about the role of collaboration current and future in addressing some of these really large challenges that we face not only as a region, but as a state, as a nation, as a society, as a globe. And the, the fact that uh, was pointed out by all three of our panelists today that we can do a lot more acting together than we can uh, by uh, acting as individuals. And so the importance of thinking about how to better support collaboration, not only from the, the, the point, and, and Rolando, such an important idea that you gave, which is to, to, to create the opportunities for finding partnerships before, and, and Benita, you pointed this out too, before the proposal gets written, uh, and, and in the, at the point of, of thinking through how to approach these, these types of questions and who to partner with and who can bring what to the table, such important ideas uh, that, that you raised here today. So from, from that to the administrative uh, challenges uh, that we face uh, in our institutions to the challenges that we face with regard to personnel and the time that our personnel have to devote to efforts that go beyond their immediate teaching uh, responsibilities and, 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 and research and, and outreach responsibilities in the university. Uh, th these, are, these are all issues that have capacity related needs associated with them. And, and uh, again, I have tremendous appreciation for the three of you uh, for spending time with us this afternoon for this discussion. I don't see a, a new question that's come in, but our audience has stayed with us throughout this entire conversation. So that gives you a sense of how important and, and how committed we all are to coming up with better ways to collaborate as we look to the future. So thank you to the three of you. I thank the committee uh, that has been working on addressing collaboration in the land grant university. I thank Robin Chun and, and her uh, team at the National Academy of Sciences for supporting us in these efforts. Uh, and I uh, wish you all a pleasant rest of the day. So thank you all and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right, thank goodbye. You to be part of this.